Aloha, and welcome to the first episode of World of Books, a show that will talk about books. My goal is to maybe help you select your next read or bring some new perspectives to what you've already read, um, help you enhance your research on certain topics, or maybe you know, push you into writing your own book. And um, today we're going to talk about the book Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder. And my guest today is Holly McLeod. Um, she is my good friend and um, fellow avid reader. And Holly runs a free public library in her neighborhood in Lahaina and also volunteers for Maui Friends of the Library Bookstore, also in Lahaina. Last but not least, Holly is the owner of a design company called Shark Pit, Shark, Shark Pit Designs, a company that um, hand designs logos and stickers and um, sell them, sells them for um, um, to the interested parties and the Profits are donated to local uh, groups. So Holly, thank you for joining me today and for taking the time and for reading the book. You're very welcome. <laughs> so um, for our readers, I'm gonna give a little intro. Um, the author, Timothy Snyder, is a very uh, well-known historian. He's a professor at uh, Yale University and he speaks five languages and can read 10 languages. He is an absolute expert in Eastern European history. And um, he's uh, published several books. This is just one of them. Uh, Bloodlands, um, which is the history of Europe between Hitler and Stalin was published in 2010. And here we are in 2022 with a war in Ukraine and I keep thinking about the relevance of this book. I've picked up on a lot of points that are um, kind of related to what we see on the news. And I, I wonder how, how you feel about that, Holly. What, what did the book tell you? And was it relevant in any way to you? Oh, well, I feel like something that's truly historical, that's new information, relatively new. It's not something that we learned when we were in school, especially at least not where I went to school. And um, plus the information wasn't available at the time. So I just feel like knowing what happened and knowing about historical events is always relevant. It's always really important. I feel like we should never not know the truth of what happened in the past, but definitely, especially now with Ukraine and being on the brink of another, you know, possibly huge mass starvation, who, you know, yeah, we definitely need to take as much as we can and learn from history or, you know, just try to see, you know, what could possibly be happening now. So you already know, but I am um, actually from Romania. So regarding your comment about what we might have learned in school, um, we haven't learned about this much either. And that is because just like the other countries that are the topic of this book, um, that being Ukraine, Poland, the Baltic um, states, uh, we were behind the Iron Curtain. So all the information was controlled and was not really um, you know, passed on to the West, let's say. So it is after um, 1991, that a lot of the USSR archives, the former USSR archives were open and Timothy Snyder was able to access them and thus um, you know, use all this information for, for his book. And um, you know, for our viewers, I wanna point out just a few things um, that were absolutely shocking to me. And that is that um, between the Nazi and the um, Soviet regimes between Hitler and Stalin in the bloodlands that are described as um, current Ukraine, Poland, Belarus, the Baltic states, 14 million people were murdered, 14 million. And 
some of them, um, I mean, this, this world genocide basically started as early as 1932 with a deliberate famine in Ukraine. Um, the, at that time, uh, Ukraine was under Soviet ruling. Uh, Stalin was in power and he decided to go through this process of collectivization, meaning that um, most um, farmers had to uh, contribute their land and their crops to the um, common agricultural entity, if you want to call it that way. So uh, because most of them did not want to participate, um, then they were deliber deliberately famished where all their crops, all their animals were uh, taken away and um, uh, they were left with not even grains to plant for the next season. Um, it, famine is a very, very hard topic for me to, to read or to even think about. I feel like something that kind of occurred to me reading the book is like you hear about gassing, you hear about shootings, you can wrap your head around those, you can visualize it, it's murder, it's horrible. When you hear that millions of people were starved to death, it's like, you almost have to decide that like, it's not just something that happened to these people, it was a deliberate way to murder them. It was slow and painful and, it, you know, just brutal. And it happened to millions and millions of people in you know different time periods throughout these 12 years from you know like you said 33 to 45 is when the blood land like when the 14 million people were killed it's just i think people gassing and shooting and stuff seems cleaner it seems like something we can accept we've seen it in movies we've seen it you know on the news but like forced starvation this this thing it's not just something that happens like it's, it was specific and deliberate and brutal. So once the, uh, you know, the Soviets were, um, I went through this process of, of collectivization, the war started. And now the same territories that have suffered so much, um, you know, through Stalin get to be occupied by the Germans. And now there's different reasons for them to be persecuted, executed, and famished again because it's a war and there isn't enough food for everybody. Yeah. And um, I, I've, I've written down like, um, like year by year account. So the um, deliberate famine in Ukraine in the early 30s killed 3 million people. Then Stalin's great terror, which was persecuting people that were opposing his system, 700,000 people were killed. Um, in Poland between 1939 and 1941, which is after they were occupied by the Germans, 200,000 people were killed. And primarily these were the elite. They, the Germans wanted to, um, to eliminate the thought leaders and uh, the intellectuals. The, between 1941 and 1945, uh, during the German occupation that now extended even into Russian territory, four million people were killed and a lot of them through starvation. Um, 5.4 million Jews were gassed and in occupied territories. And uh, what this book reveals, as a matter of fact, that the Germans' po um, policy was to primarily persecute and uh, gas and um, starve um, in their newly occupied, occupied territories rather than in uh, German, the original German territories. Yeah, that was surprising to me too, that German Jews were able to leave for the most part, they were such a small percentage of the Jewish people that were killed, the whole, you know, throughout those years. Yeah, I think about 90% of the Jews that were killed in these, um, you know, 13, 14 years were actually outside of Germany and outside of Western Europe. They're primarily in Eastern Europe. And, you know, Poland was sort of the country where that had the largest um, Jewish population. So um, 
the um, back to my question, how relevant is this to, um, in today's world and what we're going through? And I can't stop relating it to um, politics and our current US politics and world politics. And um, in the book, the author, Timothy Snyder, says that um, the two systems, um, Hitler's and Stalin's, had a few things in common. One was that they both opposed liberalism and democracy, and that's fairly obvious. But where what really caught my attention is where he says um, the word party in both um, systems seem to be inverted. Uh, rather than being defined as a group among others competing for power occur according to a set um, or accepted rules, um, it actually, the party became the group that made the rules. And here we are now, you know, in a two-party system in US where we see probably the biggest um, divide ever between the two. Um, that, can, can you relate this to, you know, US politics as well? Or what do you well, think? Yeah, like you just said, we have these two parties that are kind of making up the rules and, and, you know, changing the way we do things based on what their priorities are, or their goals are. And yeah, and then there's still what's going on in Ukraine. <laughs> and like, I feel like Putin and Stalin are starting to look really similar. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's that's how I felt. And, um, you know, as I was reading the book, I could see this and this and that. And it's like, oh, my God, history repeats itself. And, um, you know, it's, it's have, have we not learned from the first time around? And how, how can we let anything like this happen again we, we or, can't let it or happen they again. did learn from the first time around and they're taking notes <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yes it, it, yeah they didn't write the, they, they didn't learn the right things i guess right. <laughs> so yeah so did you um i mean what were the, the most shocking parts other than the massive number of people that were killed executed Damaged and so on. Did anything else catch your attention? Any special quote? Um, did anything else really catch? Well, the part I mentioned about how he, you know, Hitler was so adamant about like purifying and getting rid of the Jewish race altogether, but he had to keep conquering other places to do that because there weren't enough in Germany that it was such, what did he, I think I read like a quarter of 1% were, were Jewish Germans. So he had to keep, you know, moving and taking over other places to find people to kill, which is just crazy. And then um, for Ukraine and just their fertile land, they just always got the short end of the stick. And I think when Germany occupied Ukraine, Eventually, it was sad and shocking that the Ukrainian people almost accepted it because they had already been through so much and having the Soviet rule wasn't great for them. So they just kind of, they didn't know yet, I guess, how bad it could be or how bad it was going to be. So they just kind of, they didn't, they just weren't as afraid or maybe they just thought, well, it can't get worse than what we have now. And that was sad. They're very resilient people. I know. I think. Definitely. Yeah. It, and I mean, you, you could see it again nowadays, how resilient, resilient they are. And the, you know, um, the author mentions this utopia that both Stalin and Hitler had. Um, Hitler thought that he would conquer the Soviets in 12 weeks which was unrealistic. And meanwhile, Hitler also thought that he would colonize Eastern Europe in 12 weeks and that didn't happen. And um, it kind of rang a bell with me because Putin also thought that this, you know, um, gonna be easy. Uh, invasion of Ukraine is gonna go really fast and be very effective. But uh, in fact, 
um, I think uh, the Ukrainians kind of got a preview of this back in 2014. And this time they said, we're not going to let you do it. This yeah. is not going to happen again. And I feel like with so, social media and with me media in general and, you know, just the widespread information that we have now, they have so much more support and, you know, like you said, all of this stuff, all of this information was behind the Iron Curtain until the 90s. And that can't happen anymore. There's not going to be this, you know, decades where we don't know what happened. We're finding out what happens minutes later. <laughs> so it's a little harder to get away with the same types of atrocities, I think, because you can't hide it. Yes. That's, that's right. You know, back in the day, you know, information was not flowing as easily as it is now. Mm -hmm. And it was much easier. I mean, it was easier to censor it. Uh, today, though, we're dealing with a different kind of uh, challenge. And that is that manipulate, uh, manipulation of the information and, you know, new technology where, you know. Yeah. And they, just because we know about something doesn't mean we can stop it. Right. What um, the other part that I, you know, kind of got me thinking is I always um, try to um, look at the information I get from books like this and bring it into current events or locally, and um, you know, back to this idea of famine and um, you know how um, how many. <sighs> people died because of famine, you know, it also made me thinking here, here we are in the middle of the Pacific, an island with actually limited land that can be used for agriculture. And we're dealing with, we're not dealing with famine, obviously, but I think we're dealing with severe challenges when it comes to feeding ourselves from our own land. Yeah, I mean, our shelves are empty right now at the grocery store because we have so many extra people on the island right now. So yeah, we're, I think about it all the time. My, my daughter did a project at school last year about shortages on island and we had to go around and take pictures of all the empty shelves. And yeah, it's definitely concerning. I, we always talk about how we should be farming and gardening and growing our own food. <laughs> right. And, you know, it, it looks like, yeah, there's plenty of, uh, uh, places to do it. We do have challenges, you know, topography of the land. We have the challenge of water, not enough water, and we're dealing with global warming, and that's going to be even less water. So, yeah, um, that's um, um, so. While I was reading this book, which is, I have to let the viewers know, um, it's it's very well written. Um, it's very informational. Um, it's heart touching because it actually turns the numbers into people. There's so many stories of so many people that were affected by um, uh, these events in the bloodlands. Um, I was trying to think of, um, or so some of the stories reminded me of other fiction books um, because we've been. It seems like it's easier to reach the masses with fiction than with nonfiction. And um, it did, did this remind you or point you towards any fiction books that you think are connected to this topic? There was a story in the book about, I think they were, I don't remember if they were Romanian or Belarusian, I, I forget, there were sisters that like carved a message for their mom in the side of a church before they were killed. And um, I thought of them and I was, I thought of just about every other like Holocaust book because like, you can't help but compare the, the visuals, you know, of these girls saying, leaving a message for their mom knowing that they're never going to see her again and she'll probably never see this message. And um, just, I mean, I've read a lot of the same books that you have probably the nightingale as the sisters you know surviving world war ii in france um there's the book yeah, the, the great one the the uh, nightingale actually you know uh before reading this um uh, book by timothy snyder um 
I think I read it a couple of years ago. Anyhow, one of the images that really stuck with me is when the main character, you know, she's trying to, is craving for a meal with flavor. Obviously they had no food. And she is saying, oh, how much I wish I had an onion. And, you know, she didn't say, I wish I had, you know, a chicken. I wish I had, I don't know, steak, (laughs) chocolate. How much I wish I had an onion. Um, And, um, you know, it, it, it always comes to mind to me when we have to prepare for some sort of natural disaster. It's like, <laughs> probably be good to have an onion in this, you know, even if it's perishable. Yeah. 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 Um, the, so it seems to me there are more books about the Holocaust than there are about all these stories of um, uh, famine and starvation. Yeah. And uh, but I've, I've recently read one that I strongly recommend um, to you and our viewers. I don't know if you read it. It's um, City of Thieves by David Benioff. And uh, it's basically the story takes place in what was then called Beningrad when the Germans were trying to take over the city. And um, what um, it, it's. I mean, again, it's a terrible, ter- there's terrible events, but somehow the author um, manages to, to create a wonderful story and um, it ends on a, um, not joyful, but more optimistic um, note. So um, if you come across it, uh, again, it's called City of Thieves and it's by David Benioff. And um, it's um, um, it's a good uh, book to read. But for for our viewers, I also want to point out that um, Timothy Snyder also uh, wrote a book more recently called On Tyranny. So that's probably an interesting one as well. A pretty serious book again. And um, um, there's another book that is recommended that is recommended in the um, by Timothy Snyder in his book, um, another historian, um, Hannah Arendt, and the book is Origins of Totalitarianism. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something to, to consider as well. Well, um, that's, um, those are the books that I could think of. So before we wrap it up, because we only have a couple of minutes left, um, Holly, any last thoughts, last ideas? I don't know. I just, I thought it was so fascinating that it wasn't about a regime or a country or a dictator. It was about a, an area. And I've never read anything like that before that just really like specified or, or you know, it was about the history of this area in this time frame, And I thought that was really fascinating. So just for historians out there or for people interested in Eastern Europe history, that was a really neat take on it too. Like it, it was about a place and not, you know, egos or governments or anything, just, just where these people were. That was really neat. And the, um, I should say that the books, the book has a lot of maps. So it definitely, they help kind of figure out where you were at. (laughs) Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, so absolutely um, a a good book for people that are interested in the history of the area and um, anybody that wants to know more about what happened then. Again, most of the information was not uh, made available uh, because, um, you know, the uh, all these former communist countries um, where with the Russian influence, it, it was just not good PR to say how many people were killed by the Russians. Um, so again, uh, a good book. And I, um, I, I definitely recommend it as well. Um, now for the next show, uh, we're going to stay on theme. And we're going to um, 
read a book by a contemporary Russian author. Um, her name is, um, Guz, I might be butchering uh, her name, Yuzel Yakina. And the name of the book is Zuleika. And it takes place in the 1930s. And it's the story of a woman from Kazakhstan that ends up in the Gulag in Siberia. Um, I've read the book in Romanian. So it tells you if it got to be translated in Romanian, it's got to be a good one. And, uh, but the book is available in English on Amazon. And um, it, it's gonna, um, so viewers get ready, read the book and join us for the next uh, episode of World of Books where we're gonna talk about it. Until then, Ali, thank you very much for joining me and for taking the time and for reading with me and uh, to our viewers, read it all. <laughs> read as much as you can. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.